Hi everyone, welcome to this week's Music Wise. I'm Donato Cabrera, the music director of the California Symphony in the Las Vegas Philharmonic. Sorry for the slight delay, but sometimes life happens. This week, uh, an old friend of mine from my years living in New York City is, has so graciously agreed to join us. Um, Kelly Hall Tompkins has become really one of the, a sought, one of the most sought out uh, uh, soloists uh, as of late and uh, her journey to to where she is now is is a really interesting one and something I'd like to focus on as well uh, as her <clears throat> her incredible sense of 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 what it means to be an artist in today's world and uh, the organizations she's helped uh, found and and to be a part of so help me welcome to music wise Kelly Hall Tompkins hi Kelly hi Donato great to see you thanks for having me we we were just trying to reminisce as to the last time we actually saw each other in person you know i thought a lot about this over the years it's of uh, uh since of since so, uh, social media has sort of taken over in many ways our lives it's hard to figure out when people when we actually see each other in person these days of yeah course. right well of course now it's not hard to figure out it's well, at least it's whatever you remember plus seven months <laughs> <laughs> that's right well, regard, re regardless of the potential decade plus years that we've seen each other in person last seen each other in person uh i've i've, be I've been such a, an enormous fan of of what you have done in the interim and and um i'm really happy that you have uh, had the time to found the time to join us on music wise this week um but i want to get started it really about the, the beginnings of of how we met and more and more importantly about uh where you were in the early 2000s um and sort of take the journey from that moment to now because it's a it's a it's a wonderful it's a wonderful story and it's not and you, you, I think you would agree with me. It's not per, the the typical path of a of a of a, a soloist specifically. Of course, who who knows what a typical path is these days? But um, right. regardless, um, tell us a little bit about um, you, your your background a little bit. Where where, where you were as a violinist when when we when we met. Well, I started my, I had the most traditional education imaginable, which is what makes it so remarkable that I've created such a non-traditional career. Um, I, I thought I wanted to be in an orchestra. I absolutely adore the orchestral part of the classical canon. Um, but, I, but I also felt a certain sense of gravitational pull, like it wasn't really my choice, mm -hmm. that it was something one, one was supposed to do. Um, so, and I had had early successes. I got to study with one of the, you know, the greatest teachers in the, in the orchestral world after Charlie Castleman who was a wonderful violin soloist from like the age of 11, 12, 13. Um, I studied with Glenn Dictoro, who was the concert master of the New York Philharmonic. And within, you know, a semester of doing that, I was a runner up at the New York Philharmonic violin auditions and almost got the job there while I was in school doing my master's. And after that, I thought that would eventually be my life. I thought, you know, that I would get the Philharmonic job. That didn't, in fact, happen at that time. Um, I got, I won another major orchestra audition, but it, that didn't work out. I didn't get hired, actually, mm -hmm. after doing the audition. And then I, you know, I was in such great audition shape that I think I was, I was due to win whatever audition came next. <laughs> and that was the New Jersey Symphony. And um, I stayed there for many years and enjoyed so thoroughly playing with Zenik McCall and Nama Yerevi. And I was, um, you know, I really do love the orchestral canon. Do you think, um, but I, 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 sorry to interrupt, but was, do you, do you attribute, a, a, attribute that love or fascination with orchestra playing? Were you uh, to maybe a youth orchestra experience or what was it? I fell in love with it right away, and I, I I have always had this sense that I knew the music before I had a right to know it. Before I was actually introduced to it, or when I was introduced to it for the first time, I had a sense that I already knew it. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. I was I became the youngest member of the Greenville Symphony while I was in high school. So some of the great 
works um, you know, of the repertoire I played back then. You know, I played the Tchaikovsky Romeo and Juliet. I even played Mahler Resurrection Symphony as a high school student. It just blew me away. I, I had the great honor of being a student at Tanglewood um, in the high school program, the Boston University Tanglewood Institute. And two summers of just incredible repertoire there, you know, Stravinsky, Rite of Spring, uh, Strauss, Ein Held and Laban, Brahms Three, Haydn, Lord Nelson, Mass, W.C. La Mer. I mean, I was totally smitten with all of it. And so, um, but again, I, I also had these, these tuggings since I was a young child as a soloist. And I just felt I got to a certain point where I just accepted the notion that that wasn't practical. And mm -hmm. so I, I ended up going in the direction that it seemed, you know, only made sense. And um, and I was in this job, which was not, it didn't end up being, it's not a, it was not then, and it still is not a 52 week orchestra. So it left me room to sort of discover myself. And that's, I that's, that's exactly what happened. I mean, for me, that was my first professional position as, as a, a, an assistant for New Jersey Symphony. And one of the mm -hmm. things I appreciated in looking back at the time, I didn't have the sense to uh, appreciate it. Uh, but as looking back to that orchestra, you know, because it wasn't a full-time orchestra, yet it had a, such a high quality of music making, I think it allowed the musicians to come to that those rehearsals with a real fresh perspective rather than the weekly grind that can often happen with a major symphony orchestra. Yeah, I think there's still, a, you know, there's still a, um, you know, a voluminous amount of material that comes with being in a in a regularly performing orchestra, particularly as a first violinist, as I was. Um, but I think, yes, that's absolutely correct. I think it, it allows you a certain fresh perspective. It allows you a little bit of distance, whereas the, the other orchestras that are just, like you said, a weekly grind, um, perhaps don't offer that. But I, I, I think first from, you know, a little bit of a hybrid of com, com, continuing the endeavors that I had already been involved in as a student, doing concertos here and there, doing recitals, um, and then partially because of necessity, because so many of my weeks were open with the New Jersey Symphony, which is how the path through which I think I had a chance to find myself and really discover my voice and really, or just have a, a sense that I really want my voice to be discovered or to be heard. I think that's an important uh, way of looking at it because, you know, once you especially if you were to have gotten into the New York Philharmonic or a full-time orchestra, it would have been that much harder to be a self-starter to really create those opportunities for you to pursue a solo, solo repertoire, perform solo repertoire, chamber music repertoire. Whereas with the New Jersey Symphony, it, it gave you those open weeks, but you still had to be the self-starter. You still had to be that entre oh. have that entrepreneurial spirit to make that, to start that leap. I remember there's somebody um, actually in the symphony, he has since passed away just within this last couple of years, Paul Harris, he right. was a, the principal bass player. I used to play for him before really? auditions. In fact, before I even got into the New Jersey Symphony because I think I was a sub there. Um, and I used to play for him before big auditions with various orchestras. And he, he was like, you sound great. He's like, one of these is, you know, you're going to land one of these. He's like, but you're not going to be happy there. He's like, he's the first person to sort of put that in my consciousness. He's like, you're going to, he's like, you're going, you'll be happy for maybe five years and then you'll want to move on. And I was like, are you kidding me? If I, <laughs> you know, but I, I, I found that to be true. I think it was a, really a blessing to, um, to find myself in an orchestra like New Jersey Symphony where the quality was very high, but it wasn't full time. I do still think I would have made the leap if I had, if I had, um, you know, pursued that, that vision to its end to a, you know, to a 52 week orchestra. Yeah. I think it might've taken longer or maybe it would have taken less time, <laughs> but I think I, I think I would still have, um, I think I still would have left to pursue the, the calling became too great. I remember there was a show, um, an Oprah Winfrey show that I saw once where she said something like, um, and it was when this was sort of on the back burner of my consciousness and it hadn't really you know, insisted on being any further to the forefront. She said something like, you, you can't wait 
for the parachute to appear and then you jump. It doesn't work like that. The universe doesn't respond to that. You have to jump first and then the parachute appears. And I was like, that's crazy. There's no <laughs> way I'm gonna do that. <laughs> but eventually I, I just came to that realization. I said, I don't know if she's right or not, but I know I have to do this. So, so how did that, what were some of the first projects that you created to begin that process? Well, the first thing I did was to take a leave of absence mm -hmm. um, to sort of test the waters. And I was like a kid in a candy store because I love playing in an orchestra with a music director, but here I could direct the programming now uh, mm -hmm. for the first time of my career. And I could choose how it should go. And I should, you know, could choose, <clears throat> excuse me, the kind of project that it would be. So the first thing that I created was this, my imagination project. My previous mm -hmm. CD in my, uh, in my own voice was actually, that was kind of the pre uh, the pre re resignation test balloon. <laughs> I literally called it in my own voice, and I could not be more proud that that CD is now featured in the Smithsonian Museum of African American History. Really, um, so, what an accomplishment! That's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Well, somebody told me that one day. I didn't. I didn't even know about it. The curators didn't reach out or anything. I'm. I'm honored that they chose me. And you know. And so when people started visiting the museum, I started getting these these photos posted on Facebook. Kelly, there you are. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I think nothing could be more confirmation or affirmation of just this this life force that I said yes to than, mm -hmm. than something like that happening. Um, but as I was releasing that disc, uh, the the music industry was was shifting so rapidly. It was 2008, mm -hmm. um, and the landscape was shifting, and the bricks and mortar stores were closing. I was so so grateful and proud that when I sent it to EMI Classical, the big classical label, they took the time to call me and said, we love this disc. If we weren't going out of business, we would produce this disc, you know? But that's, it's, it's funny, but it's also, it was it's one of those things that gives you the boost that you need. It's like all of these confirmations from the universe that are, that are, uh, that are echoing what you feel in your own soul. And so I think, um, that was helpful for me, but I I was um, glad to put it out there another way with a different label. But the first thing that I did when I really um, left that part of my career was to create this imagination project. And with the um, the music industry in a in such a strange series of you know questions and do we go all digital? Do we still do CDs? I thought I'm not going to contribute to a to a, a, a dying medium, I'm gonna do something different. Mm -hmm. And looking back to my teenage years, I loved music videos so much. So I thought I'm gonna do something off the wall. I'm gonna create music videos. And I want to, I'm not looking to just reach classical musicians with this. I wanna do something that will broaden, that will sort of blow the water uh, out, you know, blow out of the water the concept of who the audience is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, first by creating a music video in the first place, but making it accessible to people that wouldn't necessarily think that they would choose classical music. And I wanted to pair that with, uh, I, I did, a, I, so I, I did two videos, a big um, virtuoso classical piece paired with my jazz inflected arrangement of Pure Imagination from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> One of my favorite songs. <laughs> yeah, mine too. It's and that project line. got over a million views. So it, it did exactly what I was hoping. So the, the, the video we have though is of, the, uh, is of the, the big classical piece. You know, when I watched it, uh, well, I wa when I watched it for the first time, I was blown away. But well, as you said, it's so beautifully produced. How, how did you connect yourself? Because you know that it's one thing to have this idea, but it's another thing to be to able to find someone to collaborate with to able to to sort of see your vision through cinematically. How did that That's process exactly happen? right? <laughs> and that was a big and very daunting uh, prospect. I just knew. Um, and so to make a long story short, I, I connected with anyone. I didn't know anything about the cinematography world but I sent out feelers and asked for recommendations. And I got this list uh, from my recording engineer, my audio recording engineer, who I worked with many times and trusted. He gave me, um, uh, he referred me to a filmmaker of a major Hollywood film and said, I, 
I don't know if she would necessarily be interested in doing this, but she could connect you with some other folks. And she did that. She connected me with some wonderful filmmakers who all had, you know, uh, Hollywood celebrities on their on their demo reels. I'm thinking, I don't think this is going to be in my budget. <laughs> but they were they all, you know, were were, you know, had wonderful meetings with me. And I thought this I, I wasn't sure if they had the sensibility to do what I was looking for, although the, the quality of their work was just obviously um, phenomenal. And then one day I went to a concert to support um, a composer that I know whose work was being, it was Christopher Tin, whose work was being featured in Avery Fisher Hall by an orchestra, um, you know, playing for the first time a concert version of this disc that was very successful. And uh, I was seated, seated next to this guy and his girlfriend and the guy had a Beethoven hat. And I thought, oh, how funny is that? And um, it, it, because this concert was not a classical music audience, it was a gaming audience oh, because God. the composer was, is one of the most successful composers of gaming music. Mm -hmm. And this piece happens to be kind of a crossover. In fact, he won the Grammy for classical crossover in the year that oh, it came wow. out. And so it was not a classical music audience at all. And every time I went around, you know, I, I went to, uh, you know, the restroom and outside that there's the guy with the Beethoven hat. And then at the end of the concert, there were two big long lines and um, one to get by the CD and one to greet the composer. And I wasn't sure which was which, I just stood in one. And lo and behold, there's the guy with the Beethoven hat. And I'm like, <laughs> clearly we have to meet, what is your deal, you know? And he says, oh, I'm a cin cinematographer. And I thought, well, that's interesting because I'm looking for one right now, thinking to myself, there's, there's no chance at all that this random guy that I met at a concert is gonna be the person to do this vision that I have in my head. But um, I met with him and I kept saying to myself, the funny thing is he hasn't done anything that is similar to what I'm looking for. And yet I have this gut sense that he's the person for this project. You know, and my mom kept saying, but, but, but has he done anything? I'm like, no, he hasn't done, he's done lots of great things, but nothing like what I'm looking for. Um, but it turned out he had a sensibility about music. He plays the violin. Um, he has some composing in his background, and it just turned out to be the perfect fit. Well, let's let's watch the video. What what is the piece uh, again that that we're going to be watching? We are going to be watching the sixth violin sonata by um, Izai, who is a, a virtuoso Belgian violinist composer. He really didn't write anything except virtuoso violin works, and um, and they are some of our most celebrated and uh, feared repertoire. <laughs> Um, and beloved as well. And I wanted to do something with a, you know, a single movement grand statement. And for me, this, this was the piece for that. Great. Let's take a watch.
Thank you, Maggie. <laughs> it's never a great place to stop. It's such yeah. a great, it's such a wonderful piece. But it I, is. you know, uh, and 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 for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Isai's sonatas, they were inspired by the the great sonatas and partitas of Bach, uh, and uh, just in wonderfully inventive pieces and as you mentioned they they are they are daunting to say yeah. the least. <laughs> and they're all in individually inspired i believe by individual violinists and that one was inspired by a spanish violinist and so it has a little bit of a habanera flamenco ish feel which we will hear a little bit more of today <laughs> that, that's right <laughs> so one of the things I, I remember so much is that uh, so fondly is that we uh, you had a car I didn't. <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> and, and we had so many uh, wonderful conversations in, in the uh, hour or so drive to and from Newark from Manhattan. And one of the things that I, I was always so uh, impressed with was that you had such a clear idea of, of, of uh, your political stances, of phil philosophical. I mean, our, our conversations were really, really engaging, and I appreciate. I still appreciate them. I remember when, when by the way, you may or may not remember this, but uh, how uh, pro euro. Remember when the we were talking when the euro went into effect, and how how the how how uh, strong that economy, the British or the European economy would be now that the euro was going to, to effect. And I remember you being quite the francophile. <laughs> yes, I am a, quite a francophile. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, along the way. Uh, you created something that is still is now celebrating its 15th year which just blows my mind uh it's about the same age as the i i started the american contemporary music ensemble at about the same time and it is a, also celebrating its 15th season in new york um tell us a little bit about how this incredible project music kitchen food for the soul um it is the pioneer organization to bring artists, classical music artists into homeless shelters. Not just any music artists, but top music art, uh, classical music artists. And in those 15 years, we've played over 100 concerts, presented over 200 top artists like Manny Axe and Glenn Dicktero and some wonderful emerging artists, Terrence Wilson, Alexis Gerlach, and some really amazing people, Adrian Dan, which I could go on. Albert Meyer. And Albrecht Meyer, the principal oboist of the Berlin Philharmonic, and reached an estimated 30,000 shelter clients. And um, it has just been one of the most um, transformational endeavors of my career, really. I, I used to think of it entirely separately. It's this thing that I do um, for people and for myself, and my career is over here, but more and more presenters really think of those things intertwined. And when I'm um, invited as a guest artist. I, I've always used my career to elevate mm -hmm. uh, to elevate Music Kitchen, both through the the professional contacts, the artistic contacts that I have, and the platform that that I enjoy. And um, I think increasingly presenters um, think of me in in you know with both hats. And so when I go to do a concerto, the the orchestra might also invite me to do the first. Or a music kitchen concert in that city. And that might be the first contact that they've ever had with the homeless in their community. So in, in that way, Music Kitchen has a regular presence in both New York City and Los Angeles, but through these additional engagements, we've done concerts in Paris, France, and Oakland, California, and Wichita, Kansas, Nashua, New Hampshire, Rochester, New York, Cincinnati, Ohio, and with, you know, in, um, in collaboration with the Cincinnati Symphony when I was guest artist in residence there. So it's um, it's just been a really amazing project. And to see, I, I, I kind of started, the cat the immediate catalyst was when I needed a place to run through some, some solo music. And when I saw the incredible response from the listeners, I thought, oh my God, I've just played for them a violin concerto with no accompaniment. And they love this. What just imagine if I could offer to them the amazing chamber music pieces that inspire me so much with the proper complement of artists for the score. What if I could do that regularly? And so I set about to raise some money to make that happen. And all the while I was totally um, 
worried and concerned. I thought, what if that was a fluke? What if that was a fluke? You know, that that was it full, you know, that was nine months ago or whatever that I had this experience. And now that I have the capital to sort of get this off the ground, will it happen again? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it did. And then I'm worried for the next concert. Oh my gosh, was that just a fluke? It's two <laughs> flukes now, you know, and then again and 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 again. And that's how I have become a very, very vociferous proponent of music, of, of classical music expanding audiences. And I've become a very vo- vociferous critic of the idea that classical music audience or classical music is somehow shrinking in its, in its appeal and that it's somehow, you know, lost in another century and that it doesn't, you know, appeal to, to more people. That's, that's, that's hogwash because I've seen it, you know, my little organization, of course, does not have the very high burden of ticket sales. That's a burden that many, you know, many presenters have to overcome. And that's a challenge to think how to do that. But if we're talking about the sheer, um, attraction to, and, and, connection to resonate, you know, resonating with the music, that is the essential element that is proven over and over again with Music Kitchen. It's so Brand true. new audiences each time. Uh, you're, you're absolutely, obviously, uh, we're, we're talking to each other, we're preaching to two choirs <laughs> to, because yeah, you know, exactly. as, as, uh, as both of my orchestras pro- have proven time and time again with increased ticket sales and increased uh, season, uh, subscriptions it's not the music is not dead and there's such a great need for it it just you just have to open the doors and welcome them in that's what we have that's what this industry hasn't done for over and and also i think the thing that makes music kitchen special is the performance um in a you know, there's a lot in the field particularly in the orchestral world but all over the field that i that i feel like overemphasizes technical perfection to to the elevate, you know, to you know, the the detriment of everything else. And I think that music can't just impress; it has to move people. And that means you actually have to have um, the the artistic insight with which to approach the music to give it its, you know, the full complement of nuance and and color and exploration. Not just play all the notes in the right place. Um, so I think that's one of the things that makes Music Kitchen special. And I think it's an important part of reaching new audiences. I think that's that's the magic sauce, really. And, and you know, and for those th- those artists that are musicians that are perhaps watching right now, I think one of the one of the lessons that you can share with them in in, in uh, sort of well, how did you get Manny Axe to play, or how did you get Albert Meyer to play? Your answer is you ask them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You ask them. And uh, I mean, I'm a person that asks a lot of people a lot of things. I'm not shy about if I, if I admire someone, I will tell them I will reach out, you know, to, through time and space. And if I if I want to propose something, I'll propose it. And and then when you have people as generous of spirit and wonderful as Manny Axe, who gives not only to Music Kitchen, but to other organizations with his artistry um, over the years, it's it's really just extraordinary um, what what can result and he and Manny Axe has helped from the very beginning. He was involved when this was just barely an idea out of my head, and we were we were just within the first year, I believe, maybe just outside the first year um, that when I asked, he said yes, and he has been not only a champion of Music Kitchen, but he has helped to put it in the early years on the map and as a very significant uh, change agent in our field. And um, then we, you know, we have put in the work and done, um, you know, convinced a lot of other folks as well. So it's celebrating its 15th year. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, What what is the video that we're going to see now? Uh, Well, we are going to see, I, to celebrate our 15th anniversary, I created a very, very special project um, to me. It's one of the most, um, one of the most important things I feel like I've ever done. And that is, I since the beginning of Music Kitchen, I have been soliciting and collecting the free form feedback from the homeless shelter clients. 
I'm not in, I'm not entirely sure how I thought of that or why I, I, I wanted to do it partially because I really wanted to know, is this a fluke? Is it what, you know, what's the impact that they won't share in, in speaking, but that maybe they'll share in privately in writing. And I also wanted to um, share with the donors and supporters of Music Kitchen. This is, this is part of what's happening. You know, this is what your dollars are going to, but I had really no intention of doing anything other than that with those, with those powerful words, but they have changed me over the years. They have shown me that what Music Kitchen is doing is worthwhile and is impactful, and um, it's you know it's worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for the fundraising and all of that. And so when we were coming up on our 15th anniversary, I thought, oh my God, I know what to do now with those words. I am going to. Um, they've inspired me so much over the years. I want, I want the listeners to know how much. We value them, and I want the public to understand that all lives have value, mm -hmm. and that um, that people that are in challenging economic circumstances specifically have value in a way that our society has not um, championed as of yet wholesale. And so, I invited 15 top composers to choose among this enormous body of feedback that we have. I think it's on 100 pages. 100, uh, 100 page PDF or 100 plus page, 150 pages of, of notes from people over the years. Mm -hmm. And I shared it with the composers. Uh, I, I invited 15 top composers from Pulitzer Prize winners to um, just really, you know, earth moving, emerging composers doing important work. And um, then we uh, decided to, that we would premiere one new song every month in the shelter to the clients first. So prioritizing the client access to these songs. And then I'm ecstatic um, that when I approached Carnegie Hall about this project that they enthusiastically joined as a partner. So for the Forgotten Voices project, you know, we spent 15 months premiering, or I should say 14 months premiering the songs in the shelter first. And we partnered with Carnegie Hall who's uh, contributed towards the commission and will also co-present the world premiere of the full song cycle. Now that was of course supposed to occur on uh, May 21st of 2020, but we know what happened. That's okay, we will be back. Um, really, really ecstatic that they're such a committed partner to, um, to social justice and, and really they've been doing important things before this project came along. So it's a really a wonderful opportunity to, um, to bring what I think is, is a historic and groundbreaking project to what I call affectionately the people's house, Carnegie Hall. Let's watch. The encore reminds me of a day of fishing. Fishing, all the things it entails, from moving from one fishing hole to another, to getting to that special spot, catching a small one, hooking in, and the drama of losing a potential big one, seeing the big one getting snagged on a log, hooking into the big one again, and eating it for dinner.
Great piece. Wow. Oh, so, yeah, isn't it? That, Kamala, so I forgot to tell us yeah. a little bit about, about the process of, of, of choosing the composers and, and, and about the performers that we just saw performing this great piece by Kamala. By Kamala. Yes, yeah, so this was the 15th premiere. As I mentioned earlier, we were able to do all of the 14 preceding monthly mm -hmm. premieres starting January 2019 in the shelter, but then our 15th premiere was interrupted by the pandemic, so we proceeded virtually. And yes, that piece was written by Kamala Shankaram, and um, I just was thrilled that in the beginning of a pandemic um, that she was, you know, there. I, I chose composers along the way and I and I spoke with them and of course along the way a few some things happened and some people couldn't always stay in you know by the time we rolled around to their their month things had, had shifted and that was one of those so starting a pandemic and trying to finish an enormous project sort of collided in a little <laughs> <laughs> you know a little bit of an interesting way but I could not be more pleased with how it, it turned out and um, Kamala came in and, and wrote this beautiful piece and just in time for summer, it's one, you know, the, the texts are, are all over the universe. They are very poignant, they're, they're sad, they're gripping, they are funny, they are, they are atmospheric, they're imaginative. That one is, is a more lighthearted one that was, you know, on paper about fishing, but I feel like maybe it was where we all were at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and but it feels like something more than that. It feels like realizing a difficult thing in your life that looks like it's going to slip away. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's on the surface it's about fishing, but it's very poetic in that it's about more than that. And so mm -hmm. it seemed perfectly suited to what we were all living in the pandemic. So many things had the big one had slipped away. Our Carnegie Hall concert temporarily had slipped out of our fingers. Uh, but you know, hooking in, it's about realizing. Um, realizing that big goal, that big dream. So I thought it was the perfect way to close the the initial introduction of the songs. I, I have never been a big commissioner. So it's really amazing that I should be so blown away and inspired by this particular project. And I was like a kid in a candy store, getting to know new composers' works and and reaching out to the ones that I already knew and, and really was, I just was over the moon every month uh, to see um, the realization of these songs. You know, for even even the MIDI version of the songs could you know could get me so excited um, <laughs> about the potential. And then we would sit down and and put string you know put bow to string and to see it come to life was just so exciting for well, 15 months of that. We all look forward to when when the rescheduled concert will happen at Carnegie Hall. I'm yes. sure. <laughs> so you you produce a CD, you start a you start an organization, and you're still playing in the New Jersey Symphony. But what happens next with you? Well, I just I decided to take that leap um, that Oprah mentioned about the parachute, and I just I didn't know what would happen next, but I knew that it would that it was something that I had to do. And so this imagination project that you saw, or mm -hmm. at least half of, was one of the first things that I did. Um, it was the very first project really that I did aside from practicing a lot. And I'm really excited that it got over a million views on YouTube and counting. And so it did exactly, although I, 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 I approached, knowing that I was doing something unusual, I approached um, PR consultants and to, to try to help tell the story. And one by one, I interviewed 20 of them. They all turned me down, except for one. They said, well, we do real recordings. What's with this YouTube thing? <laughs> um, but you know that 
I think I, I, I then went on to do exactly what I set out to do and got, you know, more views as an individual artist with no previous, you know, international profile than many organizations and presenters. And it put me on a map in a certain way and, um, you know, gave me a, a little more visibility to pursue the next projects and the next mm -hmm. projects and the next. And one of the things that came out of that was an invitation to be on Broadway as soloist, to be the fiddler for Fiddler on the Roof. And I, I had always, you know, thought Broadway was not really in my plans as a, as a traditional classical violinist, you know, an orchestral player. But I decided, you know, this will be the opportunity of a lifetime. And it was that and then some. It was one of the, um, the one of the greatest professional experiences of my career. Um, they, it is, a, a, it is, there are, I mean, we all, especially in the orchestra in which we met, a lot of the musicians do play on Broadway and also play in the New Jersey Symphony, but they are indeed two different worlds and two different, completely different experiences. I mean, what, a, what I'm just, I'm just fascinated about uh, by how, what it was like for you to show up at your first rehearsal. Oh. I mean, what was that well, like? Well, the whole thing was really rather incredible because um, they, wrote solos for me that don't normally exist in a score. We think, okay, Fiddler on the Roof, but the Fiddler part of it is a metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're all there trying to scratch out a, a, a decent living or whatever, as Tevia says in the beginning. It's a metaphor for something and bum, 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 is really in the original Broadway score, that's it. <laughs> mm. um, but knowing that they had drawn from a soloist, I was really deeply honored and um, and, and very passionate about the fact that I now, day to day in the rehearsal process, I had these new solos to mold and to, and to you know, react to the acting on stage and sometimes being completely alone in the theater. Of course, the, going to the theater was not the first day of rehearsal. We rehearsed in, in a recording studio. Um, but it was this, it was this, you know, lotus flower unfolding and, and my realizing that it was a creative platform that I could just explore and, and, um, and develop myself and grow. Some of the other things that I did performing during that 13 months um, were some of the best playing I ever did because I got to be a soloist every night on Broadway. Mm. That's really what it came down to, being a soloist every night, no matter what. You get stuck in traffic, you're still a soloist at eight o'clock. You know, you get, you know, whatever, there is some stressful thing that happened or whatever, you're still a soloist at eight o'clock. And it was this incredible laboratory of artistic development. So I even, I premiered, I did the US premiere of the Siegfried Matus Violin Concerto, A Dream of a Summer Night, just in the closing months of our show. And it was one of my best performances artistically because I, I had spent the last year being a soloist every night. And uh, there's really nothing like that. And not just a soloist you know, for anything, but for this amazing score and for this very, very important story, um, yeah, it was it was rather incredible. So the rehearsal was just the discovery. It was like opening the book. And I remember, I'll never forget the um, the the Zitz probe, which is the first rehearsal that the orchestra and the actors and the dancers and all you know everyone comes together in this small room for the first time. And that was mind blowing because that's when you start to really have a sense of, oh my God, this is something really special here. Mm -hmm. And and this is a really big thing. It's a really mm -hmm. big project to a lot of people. There are a lot of amazingly talented people and lots of money that come together to make a Broadway show actually get on the stage. Mm -hmm. And it's a very awe-inspiring process. You know, there's a lot to be said for, uh, we take for granted when we're, when we're playing in an orchestra, when we're in the orchestra world that to play in an orchestra is one thing, to, but, be, to, but to be a soloist every night is an entirely other thing, that they're mm -hmm. not the same. They're not the they're same. Not, they're not the same. It's a tremendous amount of responsibility, tremendous. And in, in that particular show, I was the first sound heard, mm. aside from a mechanical train sound, which was a framing device that they used for our particular production. Mm -hmm. I was the first sound heard in the theater every night. I was the last sound heard. I was the, you know, I was the first solo 
Um, and then the last solo of the of the whole three hour experience with many solos in between. It's just a tremendous responsibility and it's a joy because we had an incredible company. Um, Artevia was Danny Burstein, um, Jessica Hecht was Golda and they were, and, and the whole company just was phenomenal. It was very inspiring. Um, we, we got a chance to play off of one another, even though I was down in the pit, I was on a perch so I could see them and they could see me. The audience couldn't see me. I was um, curious was to see, I, I wasn't sure whether, how that, how that worked. That's, that's interesting. I trained a, the dancer. I was co-fiddler actually. I was the, I mean, that was not an, a technical term, but there was a dancer on stage pretending to play the violin who fit oh. more their casting model. Okay. Um, for the way that they were casting. And I taught him to look, you know, to emulate some of my solos. So they weren't all, the, there was not a, um, a fiddler character on stage each time I played a solo, but there were That's more and more because uh, the director, Bart Shear, liked um, he liked what I was doing. And so he brought the fiddler on stage more and more. And, uh, you know, there was a New York Times article that was done that featured both Jesse Kowarski and I, uh, my co-fiddler, and um, and the amazing relationship we had, and the and the wonderful thing that we created there together. But yeah, I was I was on an elevated um, an elevated perch that was you know near the stage. It was the first time I'd ever played, particularly working that hard, you know, to be a soloist every night and not be seen. It was a very strange kind of imagine. experience, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know. But as more and more, so much press came out about my playing that that more and more I would walk out the stage door and people like oh my god she's the fiddler you know <laughs> where in the beginning they had no idea they're like looking for the people that they had seen for the last three hours it was it was a unique experience and um just one of the greatest professional joys of my career so far how long did that run it ran for nearly 400 shows uh 13 wow. months and wow. I played almost all of those you know almost all of those 400 shows. Unbelievable. <laughs> what an achievement. So we have a couple, uh, we have a, a couple of videos that uh, are more recent that mm -hmm. are really uh, in the vein of, of new, of newer music of, of pieces that are written today. Um, mm -hmm. Something that you've just recently mentioned that's such become such a joy for you. Yes. And, and this uh, next piece is, is, was very much a very re a recent piece by, by Guy Mentis. Tell us about this, about this piece and about this project. Well, I love that during, obviously we've, our field has been decimated by this pandemic, but I love that, you know, it has also forced us to, to think in a new way. And I, I, that's something that I've been doing throughout my career. So I, I really, thrive in the idea of reaching new people differently and doing new things. So this, it, there was a project by the American Composers Orchestra that is born entirely of this, these circumstances during the pandemic and the shutdowns um, to commission various composers, to invite soloists, featured soloists, to choose among composers to play, um, to premiere a solo piece. And uh, speaking of Fiddler, I actually had just met Guy Mentos a year ago. We are both featured in the new documentary on the 55 year history of Fiddler on the Roof um, by Max Lukowitz. He wrote all of the music that is not Fiddler in the film. And I'm featured um, both in my, the, the solo disc that I created, um, the Fiddler Expanding Tradition, the first ever Fiddler solo disc, and my performances in the show. So in the premiere of the film last year, we were introduced we, we then, um, he invited me to have a, a jam session. I thought, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this session, but sure, let's do, let's have a jam session. Turns out we just hit it off. And um, so when ACO invited me to do this and gave me a list of 75 composers, I listened to every single one of them, but I was just drawn to the opportunity to fulfill this idea of a project together that we had wanted to do. So Guy Mentos and I both love uh, flamenco music and the piece that he, that I, you know, that he wrote for me, I suggested that it be based on flamenco and that's what it is. So I premiered it just a few weeks ago and uh, really excited to add it to my repertoire. Let's take a listen.
Wow, that's such a powerful piece. It is. And that central, really that middle section, I mean, it really brings back that, you know, the, the piazzola uh, violinist, you know, that sound, it's so beautiful, really. Yeah. Yeah, he really captured something uh, in the piece and in me. I, I love, uh, it, it just really resonates with me, that piece. So happy to add it to the repertoire. You know, uh, we have, uh, we're getting a little bit near the end of the show, but um, I, I just want to, uh, just commend you on on making that this leap. I think we're all the reason why I'm sort of focusing on this period in your in your life is because we are all in this moment of maybe what what are we going to do next? What is there? What what? Are, there's so many questions that are, are coming up for all of us, and I think this idea of what of what inspired you from what uh, the, what Oprah said and what you ended up doing is it's that is still that's still what we need to do. We still need to jump without that parachute. Yeah, it's it's so true. And I think for my particular background, I used to feel um, self-conscious about coming to a career as a soloist from an orchestral background, but now I, I don't it at all because I realize just how much the orchestra is part of me and how much that informs and, um, uh, and, and shapes my work with an orchestra as soloist. Um, I think I know the orchestra in a, in a far more intimate way than many people who think they're going to be solos from, from the beginning, perhaps might, um, you know, relate to. So this, this, uh, this piece that we're, um, uh, we're going to hear next is by a wonderful, uh, composer, Zvilich. Um, how did this come about? Uh, is it, was, is it something that happened in the last few months as well? It is. So Ellen Takes Willick is one of the composers of the Forgotten Voices project, mm -hmm. and I've gotten to know her over the last year. And um, she really resonates with my playing, which I'm very honored to, to know. And um, when, when uh, you know, with the, with the numerous police killings of African-Americans, she was deeply affected, particular, as we all are, particularly by Elijah McLean, who I you know, was practicing my scales in front of the news the day that I saw him with his violin and it just struck a chord and it did with her as well. So she wanted to do some some small thing, whatever she could to make a statement about that against it. And um, so she wrote a piece for me in honor and memory of Elijah McLean. Let's watch.
stunning, stunningly powerful piece. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Kelly, do you feel that, do you think that there is hope that we can change our, um, in terms of how our world is, from my world as a the orchestral world, from your world as a soloist, from how we program, do you think we have the potential now to actually have a more diverse sense of programming, a more inclusive um, world that traditionally hasn't been the case? Well, I think I, I, I'm really grateful to have lived through, even as we watch the, this horrible thing happen yet again um, with the death of George Floyd, there's, there seems to be this shift that occurred. Um, it, it, was a, it was a blessing to watch it happen and it remains to be seen how permanently impactful it will become. Um, I feel like our society has a very short attention span and a short memory. Mm -hmm. So, but there, I, I think there is hope. I see a lot of change happening. Manhattan School of Music, for example, is leading quite a, substan a substantial change. Um, President Jim Gandry has decided that every concert in this year, in this academic year, will include um, a work by uh, an African American creator, um, composer, uh, you know, a potentially artist, I guess, as well. And while that may seem extreme to some, think of how many programs you've been to where there has been none, <laughs> you know, where there have been none for hundreds of years, um, exclude, you know, to the exclusion, sometimes willful um, of that perspective. So I am hopeful in this moment that, <clears throat> that there, is, there is a seismic shift that I, that I hope will continue. Um, I think the, the special thing about this country in general is not, not the perfection or the realization but the setting of lofty goals and the the relentless pursuit of them. Um, after trying lots of other things first, <laughs> as as the saying goes. But I I think that you know we're it's it's hard to know where we are in in this moment from ground level. You know we are going to need some perspective of time and distance to know again how how far it goes but i i am i am optimistic that there is that we are in the midst of a shift in consciousness that i think will bring a sense um unfortunately i don't think it's going to be the last time we we have the the discussion um you know god forbid that anything you know further happens that that makes us that can makes us confront the reality even further um but but i do feel like this time has produced some you know some very substantive discussions and changes some of them are just discussions and they're superficial and they mm -hmm. They advertise themselves as such uh, while trying to pretend otherwise, and we see through those. Um, <laughs> but I do think that there are some very substantive things happening, and and I'm optimistic to see how far they will go. I am too. You you mentioned that uh, you your perspective as an orchestra violinist has played a, a large role, and as you're uh, now uh, that you're a soloist, and if there's a piece that doesn't prove it time and time again. Um, is this this next piece? We're going to hear the last movement of the the Samuel Barber's uh, incredible violin concerto. It's a piece that many young soloists choose to learn, particularly the first movement, of course. Um, but it is one of the pieces that is a uh, fraught with difficulties if a young soloist chooses to stand in front of an orchestra for the first time with the Barber Violin Concerto. Um, and I think. Uh, I, in watching your performance, I sense that you know the orchestra part, those pitfalls so well uh, that it really at lends itself to an incredible performance uh, that that usually doesn't just doesn't happen with some. Now, I'm not taking anything away from someone who 
uh, a young solo who may have never played the, the violin part to the barber or violin concerto in the orchestra. But nevertheless, it does it, it does play a, an enormous an enormous. Um, in my opinion, I can really sense that in your performance. Oh, thank you. And I was actually really thrilled to play this with Keith Lockhart and the the Brevard Music Center, and he engaged the orchestra of young people to accompany me. And I think they did a phenomenal job they doing did. so. <clears throat> it is not an easy orchestral part to play. And, um, you know, I think they really uh, just rose to the, the next challenge in their development. And it was a lot of fun and it was an honor for me. Great, let's watch it. Great performance, inspiring the next generation of young musicians to play yeah. in, in an orchestra and to become a soloist. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Kelly, thank you so much for joining. I'm sorry we, we went over, which I try, I try my best every week not to do, but I knew we would have so much wonderful things to talk about, so forgive oh. me. 
<laughs> oh, forgive me. <laughs> but thank you so much for having me. What a what a pleasure it is to reconnect and to have this discussion. Well, I'm sure we'll be having these discussions again into the future, and and um, I look Sounds forward good. to seeing to seeing your next and seeing and hearing your next projects. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. Bye bye, everyone. See you next week.